These are four of the new MacBook Pro models. I've got a base M1 Pro 14, a base 16, and then fully maxed out versions of both. I bought all of these with my own money to help answer some important questions. And some of the answers really surprised me. I also wanna talk about who does not need these laptops. And then one other thing that I don't really see mentioned in a lot of MacBook reviews, and I'm not really sure why. Here's a quick crazy story to put these laptops in perspective. So I know most of you don't edit videos, but this will still make sense to you. I was working on a battery comparison of the different iPad models, and I recorded a seven and a half hour video of my test on my Sony a7S III, and that file was 180 gigs. My main workstation is powered by a custom built PC that I paid more than $7,500 for, and that's the system that I use to edit my videos using Premiere Pro, but that might be changing soon. So anyways, I take that huge file and I import it, drop it on my timeline and play it. So, so far, so good. And then I try to change the speed. So the entire seven and a half hours is playing in 12 minutes and Premiere Pro literally stopped working. Like it still showed the file on the timeline, but it wouldn't play the clip. I couldn't scrub the timeline and it actually wouldn't play anything else that I had on the timeline. Like the, literally the program stopped working. So I decided to export this shorter version and then re-import it into another project. And this is where things got interesting. So it was gonna take Premiere Pro about an hour and 15 minutes to do that export. And I used that time to go over to my comment section and answer as many questions as I could. After about 30 minutes, I had an idea. Like what if I did that export on one of the new MacBook Pros? Like how would they handle it? So I take my SD card, I put it in the base 16 MacBook Pro, which happened to be right next to me. I copy the file over, I open Final Cut Pro, import it in and change the play duration to about 12 minutes. Now, after about five seconds, I was already able to play and scrub the timeline with no issues. I then exported the file, which took about nine minutes, copied it over to my main computer, and I still had 30 minutes left on the Premiere Pro export. So that just blew my mind because I was able to do something in less than a quarter of the time on a machine that costs a third of what my desktop costs. Now, I don't normally talk about price until later on in the video, but I think that in this case, it's imperative in order to add context. So all four of these machines are incredibly powerful, but how does the price actually impact performance? And more importantly, for real life use, is it worth spending more by upgrading to the max? The base 14 inch MacBook Pro comes with an eight core CPU version of the M1 Pro chip, a 14 core GPU and 16 gigs of unified memory for $19.99. So it's already a serious amount of money. Now, if you wanna max it out, then we're looking at an M1 Max with a 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU and 64 gigs of unified memory for $34.99. The base 16 inch MacBook Pro already comes with a 10 core CPU M1 Pro with a 16 core GPU and 16 gigs of unified memory for $24.99. And then finally, the fully specced out 16 is $36.99. So we're looking at a $1,500 difference when going from the least expensive 14 inch MacBook Pro to the most expensive, and then a $1,200 difference with the 16 inch. Now notice that I'm not including any of the SSD upgrades because those are going to be a constant regardless of which model you choose. Now I also wanna use this video to answer some of the questions that you've asked in previous videos and I wanna start out with the notch. You're probably already aware of the fact that it's there in order to allow for smaller bezels, but you may be wondering why the camera notch has to be this big. Well, the answer is that in addition to the higher resolution 1080p camera, it also houses the camera LED indicator light, which lets you know when the camera is recording, a true tone sensor, which measures the color temperature of the ambient light so the display can adjust to show colors more accurately, and then finally a light sensor, which is used to automatically adjust display and keyboard brightness. Whenever you're dealing with such sophisticated and expensive home electronics, one thing that you may wanna consider is extended coverage. And that brings me to today's sponsor, Yahoo Plus Protect Home, which offers device protection programs that provide technical support and extended warranties for any number of home devices. What's cool is that you're able to cover eligible devices regardless of when and where you bought them. And the plan covers an unlimited quantity of qualified desktops, laptops, tablets, gaming systems, 
smartwatches, and too many other types of devices for me to even be able to include. But you can find a complete list by clicking the link in the description. So for one low monthly price, you can protect your home devices and get expert tech support for almost any issue. What might be the best part is that you don't have to keep track of multiple warranty plans and everything is under one simple solution. So click the link in the description to see a complete list of eligible devices and get started. And thank you again to Yahoo Plus Protect Home for sponsoring this video and helping me create more content for you. Now back to the notch, there has been so much discussion about it, so here's my opinion. Yes, I noticed it for about 10 seconds before I actually started using these MacBooks. And seriously, I've never given it a second thought since. I've never run into any issues with menu items being hidden by it, and I know that it's possible Possible, but even if it were to happen, I know that there is a workaround that can be used until it's resolved by app updates. Now, if you're gonna look at these beautiful displays and then actively focus on the notch, then these laptops are not for you because you will see it every time. But from my personal experience, I know that it's there, but it's never made a practical difference. So I love the larger display with the smaller bezels. And I wanna get back to these displays because they are spectacular. I literally feel like no matter what I show you in this video, you're gonna be more impressed when you see them in real life. We're looking at 14.2 versus 16.2 inches, 3024 by 1964 versus 3456 by 2234. Both are liquid retina XDR displays, so they're powered by 10,000 mini LEDs divided into 2500 dimming zones. And that reduces the amount of light bleed. Now there is one big confusion about these displays, but first I wanna mention that they are ProMotion displays, which is Apple's name for adaptive refresh rate. So basically the MacBook can evaluate what type of content is being displayed. And if you're looking at static content, it can reduce the refresh rate down to 24 Hertz and then save on battery life. Or if you're doing something where there's more movement on the screen, then it can ramp that refresh rate all the way up to 120 Hertz in order to provide the best viewing experience. The one spec that most people misunderstand has to do with brightness. So with the smaller M1 MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro, Apple stated 500 nits of brightness, but with these newer MacBook models, they show up to 1000 nits of sustained full screen brightness and 1600 nits peak brightness. Well, that's only true for HDR content. If you're watching SDR content, it's still 500 nits, just like the older models. But when you play HDR content, you will absolutely notice that the display gets brighter. Now, over the past month, I actually traveled and I chose to take the 16 inch MacBook with me, which is something that I never thought that I would do. But after using this larger display, it's just very difficult for me to opt for the smaller one. Like personally, I have it in the backpack, so the larger size hasn't really made a practical difference as far as portability but I can't see how if someone has a smaller bag or if they're carrying it by hand or in a purse, then the larger form factor could become an issue. Now, something else I realized is that I want Apple to make more external displays. I mean, take this exact display from the 16 inch MacBook and then make it 27 inches or 32 inches big and then just call it a day. Now, I know that it would just crush the current Pro Display XDR, which sells for five or $6,000, depending on whether you want the nano textured glass, but this display has better off axis performance and it has ProMotion, which the Pro Display XDR doesn't. Now, I wanna talk about the differences that I noticed, and I'm gonna focus on what it actually felt like using them rather than the benchmarks. I'm also working on a more detailed video, so if you're super interested in the numbers, I got you covered. So for the majority of what I did, there wasn't really a major difference between the base 16 and the fully maxed out one. With the 14 inch, because the base model only comes with an eight core CPU versus 10 on the maxed out version, there was more of a noticeable difference. But keep in mind that if that's all you want, you can get that by adding another 200 bucks. And then if you wanna go up to a 16 core GPU, you could do that by just adding another 100 bucks. So you don't necessarily have to upgrade all the way to the max. Now I wanna bring up something that I don't hear being discussed in a lot of these reviews. These laptops are targeted at an audience that's actually going to make money by using them. And when you look at the different choices through that lens, then things start to shift a little bit. There's a lot of talk about specs and performance, but there's rarely discussion about time and how the improved performance actually improves user experience. So let me give you some examples. And again, I'll use video editing, but you'll be able to extrapolate how this will relate to development or music production, 3D workflow, or whatever it is that you're gonna do with these. There are a few things that are important to me when I'm editing. 
One, I wanna be able to scrub the timeline without any lag or skipped frames. Two, I wanna be able to add adjustment layers, motion graphics, and effects like image stabilization, and then still have smooth playback. And then three, I want faster render times. And I can tell you that the fully specced out models definitely perform better both on the 14 and the 16 inch models. Now, there was less lag when hitting the space bar for playback and there were less issues when editing at two times speed. Effects and adjustment layers had less of an impact on playback and the render times were faster. But this is where I want you to think about your own workflow because personally, it's much more important for me to have a better user experience when editing than to get faster render times. If I publish three videos a week, that's three times I'm going to render. So even if you cut that time from 12 minutes to even three minutes, it wouldn't really matter to me. I'm not sitting there waiting for the file to finish rendering regardless. I'm gonna go make coffee or I'm gonna set up for the next video. So by the time I come back to my laptop or my desktop, it's gonna be done no matter what. On the other hand, I do sit there for five or six hours to edit each of my video. And it's during that time that I value having a more powerful machine. So for me, it's not about whether I can accomplish the task, like all of these can do that, but it's about the small inconveniences like having to wait for it to start playing or having to scrub back because there are some skipped frames, like avoiding those types of things saves me time and it also removes some of the frustration while I'm working. And since I work a lot, I place a very high value on my time and the experience. And that brings me full circle to the story I told you in the beginning. If I was having to render 10 or 20 of those projects a day, then cutting the render times would become much more valuable to me. If I was rendering 3D files, for example, then again, the improved performance would become even more important. So please consider your own workflow when thinking about value. So to share my mindset, going from the 2,500 16-inch MacBook Pro to the $3,700 maxed out version, is 1200 bucks. So even if I only keep this machine for four years, that's $300 a day for something that I use all day, every day to make money. That's less than a dollar a day. Now this doesn't make these laptops any less expensive, but it does add context for a user who's going to be able to do more work and make more money using the maxed out version. The one thing you give up on by upgrading is battery life. So the combination of the additional cores and the increased heat buildup, which is more likely to activate the fan, does take a toll on power consumption. And I'll include more detailed results in my follow-up video. Now, if you're not going to benefit from the additional CPU cores by upgrading from the base 14 inch, or if your workflow isn't going to gain any advantage from the additional GPU cores for any of these, or the higher memory bandwidth, or the additional video engines, then the base M1 Pro models will work great. One other consideration should be external displays. Now, I mentioned this in previous videos, but the M1 Pro supports up to 260 hertz 6K displays. And for the rare few of you who want even more than that, the M1 Max supports up to 360 hertz 6K displays and 160 hertz 4K display. Which brings me to who does not need these laptops. And the reality is most people. If you're not making money with these, then you can probably do everything you need with an M1 MacBook Air. And these really fit into the luxury purchase category. Watch this video to find out why. Click on my face to subscribe. Hopefully this video was helpful. You know what I always say, buy it nice or buy it twice. Good luck and see you soon.